Welcome back to the transfer show and what a treat. <laughs> We've been joined by the ESPN reporter Julian Loren. Welcome along. Thank you so much. Uh, Julian, look, we've been speaking about Adrian Rabio for the best part of two weeks now. Yeah. What do you think if he joins, because it's not done yet, will he offer Manchester United and Eric Ten Hag? Well, I think he's better than what they have. I'm hearing, I don't know if Kavi is the same or you are the same, but that is slowing down at the moment because United have to deal with Veronique Rabio, who is his mum and agent, and she's tough. And even more when the club who wants him don't play Champions League football, doesn't play Champions League football, which is why he wanted originally. So I think this one might be done, but it would take a bit more time than I think United expected. He's, he's, a, he's a very good midfielder to start with. I know at Juventus he's had his up and downs. I think they changed manager three times in three seasons. He hasn't maybe been his best either, personally. I don't think around him it was good either to, to get the best out of him. But I think he's better than what United have. And certainly the discussion that he had over the phone with Eric Ten Hag last week was, was very positive. Ten Hag saying to him that he's the kind of sort of box-to-box -box player that he wants and needs in his team. You share that, Melissa? The thing with Rabio is he does have attributes that United don't currently exactly, have in the midfield. Yeah. Good tackler, strong in the duels, has surety in transition. They lack all of those things. So in that respect, you think, OK, it makes sense. However, if he has been a player they've been targeting all window or they wanted that profile, Juventus have been desperate to get rid of him. Yeah. Why don't they do this deal? before they go on pre-season tour or earlier, if he's someone they've always wanted. It feels very much like somebody that they feel was easy to get, so let's just go get him, rather than somebody solidly they've held long-term genuine interest in. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And Juventus won Leandro Paredes from PhD to come and, and hmm. replace him in midfield. And I think... But who's the better player, by the way? They have these different profiles, though. I think, I think Paredes is, is very much a holding midfielder when Rabiot is more box-to-box, -box, he's, he's more elegant. He's, I think he, he, can, he needs to improve on his progressive carries and progressive passing. But I think he's, yeah, he's slightly different to Paredes. But I can understand why Juventus won Paredes. For Rabio, I, I think he would do a good job at United, I really believe, with the structure of Ten Hag. Julian, we're going to get your view on Ronaldo in just a moment, but just on Rabio Carve, uh, Julian just touched on it there, maybe it's slowing down. You, you've just got an update on it. Yeah, just speaking to our colleagues at Sky Italy, uh, they are reporting this evening that the deal may have stalled, and their information is that um, one of the biggest issues is personal terms, wages. Uh, that there's a feeling maybe at Manchester United that he is asking for more than they are willing to pay at the moment. And secondly, the issue, of course, is the lack of Champions League football. United not in the Champions League. Uh, it would be a major step down for the player uh, to move to Old Trafford at the moment, especially considering after the uh, two results this season, they're bottom of the table at the moment. But Sky Italy uh, just saying that their feeling, their information is that the deal has stalled. And of course... As Julian mentioned there, that is going to have uh, knock-on effects. Uh, they're saying that that would prevent them from the moment of getting Paredes from PSG. Uh, and as far as uh, Juventus and Memphis Depay are concerned, they are still putting pressure on the player's lawyer to terminate his contract with Barcelona. And I think there were talks uh, today between Memphis's lawyer and Barcelona about trying to make that happen. I sense another saga. Anyway, <laughs> um, talking of sagas, let's get briefly back to Ronaldo. J just, Carve, just give us a, an update on where we stand tonight. Well, look, the situation is that uh, Manchester United could be willing to let him go if Eric Ten Hag decides that that is what is best for the future of the club. Now, consistently, United all summer have said he's not for sale, he's not for sale, he's not for sale. Uh, we've reported and other people have reported that, of course, behind the scenes, uh, there are some people at United who think that Cristiano Ronaldo should be sold. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to what the manager is going to decide. But for the first time, we can report with some confidence that he may leave uh, Manchester United. May. Maybe I shouldn't say with confidence. He could leave Manchester <laughs> United because, because the information, the clubs, it's a difficult situation because from the player's point of view, he just wants to leave. He wants to go to a Champions League club. But we have to respect Manchester United's position as well. And their position is the player is not for sale. Nothing has changed. The player is not for sale. Nothing's changed, Julian. But 
We've got 16 days of this transfer window to go, a little over two weeks, and yet we are still talking about Cristiano Ronaldo. What have you made of this situation? I find this whole situation mind-blowing, I have to say. A player of his calibre, to be fair, that they try to offload like if he was a, a, an average League 1 or League 2 player. I, I can't understand that one of the greatest of all time is in this situation right now, when he should enjoy the last few seasons of his career, enjoy like all the legacy and everything that he's done, and instead he's trying to find a club. They're literally offering him to anyone in the Champions League. It's, 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 it's that bad. And I don't know who will want him on that price, even if he takes a pay cut, I don't know who wants him. Certainly not a team that plays high press or counter press football, because as we saw last season, of all the big five leagues, he's the striker that pressed the less in all of last season. So I cannot see how Thomas Tuchel or a team that plays with a high press would want someone like him in his team. And that includes, for me, Eric Ten Hag. I cannot see how the Ten Hag Ronaldo can work. And we saw that a bit at Brentford on Saturday. United, throughout this transfer window and at the beginning of the season, have been criticised heavily in many quarters. Just give us an insight, if you can, Julian, how United and their dealings and their on-pitch performance has been perceived in France. If I'm brutally honest, like a joke. And really, it's just not me or football fans in France, but also agents or people in the media. Sports who deal directors of other clubs. Everybody. From, from players' agent or players' families in certain cases, the way United do their business, the lack of strategy, the lack of organisation, the lack of everything, really, is baffling for a club of this calibre. And again, we're talking one of the biggest clubs in the world. And I just think that... Something has to change at some point, whether John Murtaugh is the right guy and, and Fletcher with him, whether you need to look somewhere else, whether it's the ownership, I don't know, but something has to change because right now, and we've seen, I mean, we don't even, this is not even us being harsh. This is the reality that so far this season, this summer, has been a big joke from Manchester United. So United getting criticised. There was some criticism towards Chelsea as well, wasn't there, Carve, from, from certain media pundits, including Gary Neville, about the way they approached the transfer window, but... They seem to be getting, like you were mentioning before, this twin track approach. And I guess the one of the big signings that they'll want to make is Wesley Fofana. Where are we with that now? Uh, look, the situation is that uh, Chelsea want to sign him. He's a priority target for them. Uh, everybody we've been speaking to, to, speaking to in the past couple of days uh, has been saying that they expect the deal to happen. Uh, yeah, Leicester don't want to sell him. It'll take a world record fee for a defender. Uh, but I think ultimately Chelsea will pay what it takes to get Wesley Fofana uh, because they want to sign another centre back and he's their number one uh, target. Obviously, they've got Thiago Silva, they've got uh, uh, Koulibaly who, can play, who plays in that position. They've got some other options there. But they really want a young player and... I'd be interested to see what Julian thinks about paying 80, 85 million pounds for a player who hasn't even played for France yet. Yeah. I mean, I think he's an amazing talent. He wants to go. He really wants to join Chelsea now. I don't know if they will pay or if at some point Todd Bailey and Tuchel think this is too much money for someone of his age with no Champions League experience, for example. They not haven't really done that yet this window, have they, Chelsea? They haven't said to a team, we're not meeting your valuation. No, that's yeah. true. But I think that's why Leicester uh, want to take advantage of it and saying, OK, you want, to, you want him, you want to pay, you've paid for everybody else right now, so you'll have to pay 85 or 90 if, million if, if, if Wesley Fofana is valued at 80, 85 million pounds, how much does that make some of the other French centre-backs worth because, <laughs> because there, there are so many good French centre-backs yeah. at the moment. And when you think how much Arsenal pay for William Saliba or Liverpool play for Ibrahim Konate or what Bayern Munich pay for Dio Pamecano, for example, which is because this is the, it's the similar age group and a similar yeah. profile, 85 is a lot of money for Fofana. He's better than, again, I think you also have to look at it. Will he improve the defence that they have? Yeah, I think so. But they might find the, the other factor you have money. to take into play is how much he's worth to Leicester City as well, right? Yeah. And you mentioned will he improve the Chelsea defence? How much he'll be worth to Chelsea? So is 80 million potentially, when you look at it on a long-term basis, well, this could be money well spent, even though it looks like a lot of money just now. Yeah, I think so. And let's not forget that you spread the amount over the five-year deal or the six-year deal that you're offering Wesley Fofana. So you don't have to pay 85 million straight away in one go to Leicester City. It's still a lot of money. I agree with Kevin. I think <coughs> this will happen. I saw him on Saturday after the Arsenal game. He, he, 
it's nothing against Leicester, and I think he will always be grateful to what Leicester did for him, going to get him in Saint-Étienne. Remember, already that move from Saint-Étienne to Leicester was a hard one. He had to push for it, put a transfer request in. I think he will do the same at Leicester, and I think eventually he will go to Chelsea. What do you think of the chances of him getting into the France squad for the World Cup? He's very close. He hasn't been called up yet because Konaté and Saliba, I think in Deschamps' eyes, are slightly ahead of him. But he's really, really close. They're monitoring him massively. He's in the, the pre-call-up list every single time. So he's really close. But we've got an incredible level of talent at centre-backs in France, which I'm not even sure how we can explain. But he's <laughs> part of the ones that he's definitely following. From his perspective as well, he'll see that Leicester haven't been strengthening. They're standing That's still and says. they regressed last season. So if he's thinking about himself, his future, getting into that France squad, he's thinking, well, the best chance of doing that is pushing for a move to Chelsea. Yeah, completely. And I think, it, again, nothing against Leicester because he really appreciates the club, the ownership, the fans, everything that they've done for him. But this is the next level, you know, and that's no offence to Leicester City, but he wants to play in the Champions League. He wants to work with Tuchel. Working with Thiago Silva is something that really appeals to him as well. And there's not many years that Thiago Silva will still be on the scene. So, so we're talking a potential world record fee for a defender and talking of record fees just another line to bring you and this concerns Wolves we we're obviously talking about potential alternates for Manchester United when we talk about Frankie de Jong not happening and Ruben Neves has been mentioned but Wolves they're looking to do their own business as well and they've agreed a club record deal with Sporting Lisbon for their midfielder Mateus Nunes the fee is believed to be 45 million pounds Sorry, 45 million euros initial fee plus 5 million euros in add-ons. Personal terms yet to be finalised, but they are hopeful of completing this deal for him to be involved in Saturday's game at Tottenham. That's a 12.30 kickoff on Saturday. Nunes, of course, would have to be registered by midday on Friday for that to happen. Now, West Ham United had also been in for Mateus Nunes. David Moyes was asked the question last week in his news conference and he was pretty honest about it. Yes, we did make a bid, but the boy didn't want to come. That's because the boy wants to go to Wolves. A bit of West Ham news to bring you, a little bit of a development on their pursuit of the PSG defender Tilo Kera. I'm told in the past few minutes he's been having his medical at West Ham United, so that deal moving ever closer. It's worth 12 million euros plus add-ons. That's around 10 million pounds plus add-ons. As I mentioned, having his medical arrived in London earlier on today, and they hope to complete that deal in time for Kera to be involved in Thursday night's Europa Conference League qualifier against Viborg. Now, you remember, Sevilla also wanted to sign Kera, German international. Um, they could offer Champions League football, but quite a significant coup this for West Ham because he wanted to join West Ham. So, Julian, what are West Ham United getting with Tilo Kera? Well, first of all, versatility, because he can play as a right back, he can play as a centre back in a back four, in a back three. That's where he's played at PSG. He didn't really live up to expectations in Paris after that big move from Schalke in, in the summer 2018. Thomas Tuchel really wanted him. They spent a lot of money, 40 million euros on him at the time. He's had some good games, but he also had some, some struggles, especially in the Champions League when the opposition level was, was, was better and, and stronger. So I think he's a good player. He's only 25. There's still room for improvement. But he's a German international. He's regularly called up by, uh, by Ansi Flick. So he's going to go to the World Cup, I expect. So he's a good player. I just, I think in Paris, they expected more from him and we didn't really see it. So, Kera looks like he's on his way and West Ham United are not finished there either. They've had quite a busy transfer window, haven't they? Including the signing of Gianluca Scamacca from Sassuolo. But they also are in for Hans Vernacken, the Club Bruges midfielder. Belgium international as well. 21 caps, 5 goals. They've made an initial bid worth around 10 million euros. That has been rejected. Club Bruges do not want to sell. West Ham, though, will go back in because there's a growing belief that Vernacken does want to join. And one other line to bring you to do with Emerson. Uh, West Ham United still waiting for a response from Chelsea to their £13 million bid for Emerson. And they are just holding on just to see what Chelsea say. If it is the first bid... Chances are Chelsea might say, raise your offer. He's still got two years left on his contract. So West Ham United, one of the busiest clubs in this transfer window and looking likely to have a busy final couple of weeks. But make no mistake about it, Julian, the busiest club 
<laughs> Nottingham Forest, oh, yes. 15 players and counting, and the biggest one could yet be on his way. Hussam Awa. We've been talking about him on the transfer show, the Leon midfielder for the last three or four transfer windows. Yeah. And we're talking about him Arsenal, Liverpool, Manchester City, Tottenham. How close is he to becoming a Nottingham Forest player? Well, I believe he's very close now. Uh, his brother and the Nottingham Forest hierarchy have are pretty close to a full agreement. I think the agreement with Lyon is pretty much sorted for around the 50 million euro mark, uh, which is again, I think, for a player of his calibre, even with just a year left on his contract, is an absolute bargain for, much, for Nottingham Forest. The only thing is, what kind of Wusamawa will you get? Will you get the one from last season that really struggled? I think he would admit that himself. No rhythm, no end product, nothing really struggling. Uh, or the one that we saw in the final eight, for example, in Lisbon in the Champions League, where he was amazing in the game against Bayern Munich, the semi-final of the Champions League, the quarter-final against Manchester City, where he had a fantastic game again. He needs to recover that kind of form. To be, to be really added value to Forrest. But at that price, you take the risk and you go and Steve Cooper can, can turn him again into the player that he used to be. But Melissa, we talked about the clubs that have been interested in him before. This is a newly promoted team into the Premier League. Are you surprised that they didn't face more competition? Not particularly, because I think it was 2018-19 when the elite were really looking at him and considering him as a top option and since then he's played under so many different managers and systems that they didn't really seem to get the best out of him yeah, and Kaketa right. kind of overshadowed mm -hmm. him and I think there was always concern he's so aesthetically pleasing and such a intelligent player and so graceful but the physicality element the discipline out of possession all those things you know clubs would wonder can he adjust then to the Premier League with those prerequisites? You, no matter how good you are on the ball, you have to be good out of possession as well in this league. Um, and that was always the worry. Still, at that price, yeah. it's, it's really shocking given the amount of experience he has as well and, and European top-level experience. So if they can find the system that suits him best, and I think... It's closer to the final third where he can feed those balls and work in the half spaces and stuff. He can be an incredible player. I just don't know how Forrest are going to deal with this. I think there's such a thing as too much business when you're trying to integrate so many new players at once. But still exciting for their fans, obviously. We've been talking for the majority of the show about Manchester United, of course, Julian. Uh, the striker search is another one that they seem to be struggling with a little bit. But what do you make of some of the names that they're being linked with? The issue I have, I heard what Melissa was saying rightly before I came on about targeting all those strikers now and they clearly, they, they're really contacting a lot of agents and a lot of players from Dembele a Lyon to skip another player to Mateus Cunha, Atletico to Sasajit, uh, Sugar, all those names. For me, the profiles are so different. Exactly. I don't really understand why. If, if it was the same profile and you go from a short list of, OK, this is the most expensive, you might not be able to, so then you've got the second choice. But they're all similar. But now they're completely different. Some are tall, others small, fast, slow, good technique. And I'm like, OK, what do you really want? What do you need? Because I think if you're Eric Ten Hag and you've got a very defined philosophy of playing, you need the right guy in there, not just a striker, whatever the profile. Cav, j just on the strikers at United, from the outset of this transfer window, the feeling was it's a central midfielder and a striker. Is the striker a priority? Given everything that you've heard, particularly with what's happening with Ronaldo, and how big a problem do United potentially face when they're trying to buy another striker, given the issues that are present with it's Ronaldo? It's a very complicated situation because it depends on what happens with Ronaldo. And it also depends with what happens with Marcus Rashford, uh, for instance. Uh, there is some interest there from PSG. It would be interesting to get Julian's thoughts on whether you think uh, he's a player that PSG need at the moment. Well, there's certainly interest. You don't invite his brother to come to Paris all the way just to visit the Eiffel Tower. You, you go, you come, he comes there to, to discuss things, and there's certainly the discussions around the contract that they can offer him. It was very interesting, I think, to the Rashford clan. We know that Kylian Mbappé is a good friend with Marcus Rashford. We know the power now that Kylian Mbappé holds in Paris. I think it's, a, it's still a long shot because I don't think United would sell. And I think if they were to sell, it would be for a lot of money that I'm not sure PSG have right now. And just staying at PSG, what is the latest on the issue between Neymar <laughs> and Messi? There's been so much 
uh, talk of it in the fr French media. Yeah. Is there actually a real problem? How long do we have? We have to go soon. In 20 seconds. Yeah. In 20 seconds, Julian. <laughs> yeah, that penalty gate between Neymar and Mbappe was was not what the club wanted. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Just very, very quickly, 16 days to go until the deadline. Who's had the best window so far, in your opinion? I love what Spurs did, Tottenham uh, and Antonio Conte. I like what Arsenal did, and we saw there was new signings coming up. Forest, of course, you have to applaud. But I think Chelsea, in the end, will be the ones with the best transfer window Villa. in two weeks' time. Villa. Melissa, Carve, and Julian especially, thank you. thank you so much indeed. Great debut on the transfer <laughs> show, by you. the way.